Thank you, Mike. What was that last chord with you? Thank you, Michael. Well, I'll tell you what, I want to give you something tonight that has to do with uh, what we've been looking at the last few weeks on the uh, very definitive biblical attributes of God. Let me begin by uh, saying, I don't know if you've been keeping up with the news in the last few uh, days. You see such terms like economic meltdown. Russia, Japan, Brazil, one fellow said the United States is in the eye of the hurricane at present, but it will inevitably come that she will be caught up. Old viruses, do you know that? Beginning to mutate. Totally resistant to everything we've thrown against them. There is the speculation that such things as um, the bubonic plague could have a comeback. Welcome to Metro, if you're here tonight for the first time. You say, man, this is great. Uh, things like tuberculosis that we could not deal with. Malaria that we could not deal with. Islamic terrorism. The possibilities of on our native soil. Uh, there is now the um, ability of a terrorist with a handheld launcher to bring down a 747. Very real possibility. Our own president has broken one of the Ten Commandments openly, has lied of it. Fellows that lead our country, year 2000, Y2K, you've been keeping up with that? Got you a 55-gallon drum of water ready? <laughs> Bunch of dried something or other to stand off the bad guys? Case of 22 shells to eat squirrel over the next couple of years, maybe. I mean, there's all kind of great news, you know, coming down the pike. Psalm 46, don't look at it here, just listen to it. Oh, God is our refuge and strength, our very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change. Though the mountains should slip off into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake at its swelling pride, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come behold the works of the Lord who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two and burns the chariot with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. I want to show you tonight the biblical teaching on not an attribute of God, but the position of God because of the sum total of his attributes. And that is called the sovereignty of God. The fact that he is the chief and only ruler of the universe the only autocrat, the only sovereign, the only monarch. The sovereignty of God is God's controlling all events, good and evil, what he ordains and what he permits to his own purposes and ultimately his own ends and his glory. Men and Christians specifically have always struggled with the issue of a sovereign God in a fallen world, of a sovereign God with responsible entities, a couple of billion of them, entities. How do you have one chief ruler? Deism simply says man runs things. God made it. He is the absentee landlord. That was a very easy way to see God and man and his responsibility. He simply wasn't around. He had conferred title over to us. Problem is, that was too cold. Man wasn't willing to live in that universe, and he concocted transcendentalism. The theology of uh, Thoreau, Channing, Emerson, Hopkins. And 
and that God was right here with us. Nature with a capital N, the great oversoul. And he was here, the problem was he wasn't on the throne. He kind of felt sorry for the way we messed up things, but he really wasn't one who was sovereign. Matter of fact, one um, fellow wrote a book a while back, a Jewish rabbi, on uh, why do bad things happen to good people. And his conclusion was that a Christian or anybody needs to learn to forgive God. Poor fellow. He tries, but he just sometimes drops the ball. And you need to be as forgiving toward him as you are toward any limited individual. Arminianism kind of sees like a shared throne of God and man. That we kind of volley back and forth the authority of the universe. What does the Bible say about the sovereignty of God? Listen close to this message. I'll promise you there will be a day that this will be your favorite message. Promise you. The Bible says, number one, that God is sovereign over the creation. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things visible but invisible. He is sovereign over its origin. First, or Colossians says this of the Lord Jesus Christ. In him all things hold together. Hebrews chapter 1 says that um, he upholds all things by the word of his mouth. He not only originates the creation, but he is the one that brings it to its end. That he holds it together. He has not departed. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that all things exist through him and for him. Paul said, from him, through him, and for him are all things. He is the origin, the sustainer, and the object of all history and creation. Its beginning and its continuity is the glory of God through his son, Jesus Christ. The nurturing of the creation. He sends forth springs in the valleys and they flow between the mountains and give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst and beside them the birds of the heavens dwell. They lift up their voices among the branches. God waters the mountains from his upper chambers and the earth is satisfied with the fruit of his works. He is not merely transcendent above it, but he is imminent in the creation, nurturing for it. We speak often of the creation as mother nature. The Bible recognizes creation as a child that has its origin from God. As a matter of fact, it states that the um, ocean broke forth from the womb. It likens the ocean to a baby, and it says God wrapped it in, clo in cloths. The clouds are like a diaper. You ever think of, uh, what's that hurricane now in the Gulf, Earl? Great name for a hurricane that goes into Louisiana. Bob, Bill, somebody else? Yeah. That always cracked me out. A hurricane going to Louisiana, they named it Earl. What else do you name a Louisiana hurricane? The Earl. All right. And God states that the, the, the ocean is like a baby, and the clouds are like a diaper. Isn't that amazing? The creation is his baby. And he made it. He gives it life. He will develop it to its end and its purpose of glorifying him. He will even save it and give it new life. How's that? The creation will be born again. Someday at the coming of Christ. So God is sovereign over every atom in this universe. Secondly, he is sovereign over the angelic realm. O angels, obeying his word. Psalm 149. Let all the angels of God worship him. Hebrews 1.8. As a matter of fact, the name angelos means messenger. They do his bidding. The demonic realm. He is sovereign over the demonic realm. Whenever Jesus confronted a demon, the demon begged him. Don't cast me into the abyss. Uh, the demons bowed down. They reverenced him. I know who you are, Jesus of Nazareth, Holy One of God. They acknowledged their end before him. Have you come to torment us before the time? 
They ask his permission. Could we go into the pigs? Because demons seek bodies. Could we go into the pigs, please? All right, get out of here. And shut up. Don't tell anybody who I am. Yes, sir. They left. In Revelation chapter 9, demons are released from the pit, and it says they are permitted five months to sting men. They are not allowed to take their lives, and they shall not touch those who belong to God with the mark of the Lamb. God is sovereign over the demonic realm. The Bible says that God is sovereign over Satan. Simon, Simon, Satan hath demanded permission to sift you, plural Greek pronoun, the disciples. He has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. He can't do anything unless I tell him. Classic text in the Bible, God in the book of Job summons the metaphysical realm, the sons of God, the angelic realm and all else before him, and it says Satan appears, the adversary. Satan is what that means. The adversary appears before God. He's like a bellhop. Come here. And he's right there. Where have you been? Walking about on the earth, my turf. Have you seen my man Job? Yes, I have. And I think he serves you because you bless him. You remove your hand, he'll curse you to your face. Oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm going to let you have him, but you can't touch his, touch his body. You can go so far. He went out and destroyed everything he had, came back. God said, how'd he do? He said, pretty good. Skin for skin, however. A man will give all that he has in exchange for his, for his, uh, for his life, okay? You can touch his body but you can't touch his life. That's mine. God says to the ocean, henceforth thou may come and no further. And he says the same to Satan. He is sovereign over Satan and his purposes. The Bible says that God is sovereign over man's life. Thou hast formed my inward parts in the secret place. How about the metaphysical of man? God stretches out the heavens and lays the foundation of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him. Every human being that draws a breath, God knows him. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that God knows the stars and leads them forth by name, comparing the stars to a shepherd's flock. I know them, and I lead them out. It says that every bird in the hills he knows by name. And the Bible says of his elect, he knows them by name. And of everyone who lives, there is a book of their name. And of all that they have done, God knows them. Man's days. In thy book they were written, the days that were ordained from, for me, when as yet there was not one. Ecclesiastes, there's a time to be born and a time to die. Paul, preaching in Acts 13, he said, for David, after he had served the purpose of God in his generation, fell asleep. Your life is known by God, and how far you will live is known by God. In a human sense, there are accidents and murder. In the divine sense, there is his sovereign will. Thy days were ordained for me when as yet there was not one. How about this? The destiny of all man is ordained. Pro horizo. The boundary horizon is marked before man's end. His horizon is marked before. Active verb. In our Bibles, it is translated as the word pre Destinate. Do you believe in predestination? It's there. Active verb. For who? Lost and saved alike. What if God, although willing, this is not me, this is Paul talking here. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And he did so. 
in order that he might make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us who are called. In love he predestinated us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Listen to this. They stumble, the wicked, because they are disobedient to the word. And to this doom they are appointed. Active verb. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a people for God's own possession. The book of Jude, speaking of the apostates, says they were marked out beforehand for this condemnation. God uses some for wrath and to praise his justice, some for mercy to praise his grace. I know what you're thinking, same thing as Paul did. You will say to me then, why does God still find fault? For who resists his will? How many of you, be honest, were thinking that right now? Whenever I read that in Romans 9 the first time, I thought the same thing. How can he condemn a man who is created for the purposes of his justice? When I read Romans 9, I saw, I saw Paul ask that. Why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? I thought, hot diggity. I'm about to find it out. Lay it on me, Paul. And the answer I got was the most disappointing answer I'd ever seen in the Bible. It put me in my place. It says this. I back up in context. You will say to me, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you? Oh man, who answers back to God? Excuse me. The thing molded will not say to the mover, why did you make me like this? Or does not the potter have a right over clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common? And what if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and make his power known, endured with much long-suffering vessels of wrath prepared for destruction and did so to make known the riches of his glory? upon vessels of mercy. Where did Paul got, get that? He got that from Solomon. The book of Proverbs. The Lord hath made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked, for the day of evil. He will use them for his purpose. That puts you in your place, doesn't it? God is sovereign. And evil men will operate only within the sphere of of his toleration to perform his own purposes as mysterious as they may be. How about this? Man's flaws are under the sovereignty of God. A guy named Moses was called by God to preach and he said, God, I can't speak. I'm slow of speech. And God said, who has made man's mouth? Who has made him dumb or deaf are seeing, are blind. Did you catch that? Who made the blind? God says, I take full responsibility. I did it. Why'd you do it? None of your business. I'm not going to tell you. I have my purposes. Why does this guy live and this guy die? Why does James die in Acts 12? Why does John live all the way until A.D. 90? Two brothers. None of your business. He's sovereign. How about this one? The Bible states that evil and evil men are in the hand of God. So says Solomon, Ecclesiastes. I am the Lord and there is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness. Causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Isaiah. If calamity occurs in the city, hath not the Lord done it? Amos. As a matter of fact, in the book of Habakkuk, Habakkuk sees the vision of the wicked Chaldeans, the Babylonians coming to judge Israel, and he says, God, thou hast established them to correct. The Babylonian Empire was there to do evil for the purposes of God, and then God says, and then they will be held guilty. He says of the Assyrians, 
shall the axe exalt itself over the one who wields it. God raised up that wicked empire for his purpose. God says to Cyrus, thou art my Messiah. This fallen Persian king would be raised up by God to issue the decree that Israel could leave its captivity under Nehemiah and Zerubbabel and the like and come back and rebuild the city. God says to Cyrus, thou art my Messiah. Isaiah 45. Amazing. I have chosen you in the womb I made you, Cyrus, before or though you did not know me, I made you. Evil and evil men. As a matter of fact, Charles Haddon Spurgeon once preached a message on this, and it was called, Free Will, a Slave. It does whatever God dictates it to be, and he still will hold them culpable, and they still will incite his anger. Amazing. The fellow in the Bible, given a vision by God that he will be the deliverer of Israel. His name is Joseph. And this fellow is sold by his brothers. Actually, he's attempted first to murder, be murdered by his brothers in a pit. Then they sell him into slavery into Egypt. There in Egypt, he works for Potiphar and is accused of, a, of rape and is thrown in prison. There in prison, he helps a guy get out. He says to the guy, could you remember me before Pharaoh? And the guy forgets him. Isn't that amazing? And yet, when it was all said and done, God exalted him, put him right under Pharaoh, made him chairman of the wheat of Egypt that took care of that fledgling nation of 70 people in a time of famine and brought them into the land of Goshen and allowed them to prosper. And the man Joseph said to his brothers, Thou meant it for evil. God meant it for good. That's Genesis 50:20. And there will be a day that will be your favorite verse. Some of you girls in here will have a baby die in the womb. Some of you girls in here are going to have a baby have an umbilical cord wrapped around its neck. And for no good reason that you can see that child will die. And God will never tell you why. But a very bad thing has happened. And all you will cling to is thou meant it for evil. It was a bad thing. But God has meant it for good. What's the worst act that ever occurred on the face of the earth? When you have a perfect man, the Father's delight, who is betrayed, rejected, tortured, crucified, framed, and killed. The Bible says, he was delivered up through the foreknowledge and the predetermined plan of God. How's that? God had his reason. Incidentally, folks, if when evil occurs, if God is not ultimately permitting it and has it into his tapestry, into his wise plans, if God is not sovereign, if God is not behind it, let me ask you, What's the option? Do accidents happen to thwart the will of God? And if they do, who is sovereign? Oh, I had a great plan for that Christian. But he was going home, and this drunk crossed the double stripe, hit him head on, took his life. Oh, all I could have done. God couldn't you protect him? Hey, drunks have a choice. Conclusion, the universe is in the hands of drunks. <laughs> and may I say something that is a lot real scary? There are more drunks than there are gods. One God. It's a million drunks behind the wheel right now. Do you really feel that God's sovereign purpose for you can be thwarted by any evil? Do you think that there's ever a place in the Bible that God said, <gasps> Shucks. Find it. Look it up in your concordance. S-H-U-C-K-S. -S. Shucks. Shucks, saith the Lord. And God saith. He did what? It ain't fair. And I kid about that. You know the sad thing, Walt? That's precisely the deity that 98% of most Christians worship. He's a God who is sovereign to this point, And he's always snapping his fingers and doing this. 
for real. The Bible says God is sovereign over the nations. He's sovereign over the nations. Listen to this. He made from one every nation of mankind. Acts 11. Peter said that. He appointed their times, how long they can stay alive, and he appointed their boundaries. I will let Rome come up and fall. Before that, I will raise up each Greece for my purposes, Persia for my purposes, Babylon for my purposes, Assyria. I'll use them and I'll dispose of them. The nations, the kingdoms. Listen to this. Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar. You, O king, are the king of kings to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, the glory. He has caused you to rule. Nebuchadnezzar was not a believer. He was an idolater. He caused you to rule. A guy named Pilate said to Jesus, you stand silent before me. Don't you know I have authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? And Jesus saith to him, you have no authority over me unless my Father has granted it to you. Paul, there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are literally, the King James says, the powers that be derive their authority from him. They exist for his sovereign purposes. The Christian's gift. Paul said God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body as he is pleased. The reason that you have a gift to administrate, to encourage, to exhort, to teach, to give, to prophesy evil, and to speak out against it. It's because God put you in the body like he was pleased. The Bible even states that you're a state in life. As God has called each and as God has assigned each. 1 Corinthians 7. In this manner, let him walk. Were you called uncircumcised? Will you rather not be circumcised? Were you called as circumcised? Rather not become uncircumcised? Were you called while a slave? If you are able to be free, rather do that. But he who is called while a slave is the Lord's freeman. Were you called while free? He who is free is Christ's slave. What matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. You're, as it were, cast in life. Slave, Jew, Gentile, freeman as God has called each and assigned each in this manner, let him walk. Don't think you have to get up here or over here to please God. Wherever he put you, flourish. If you can change it and do better by where you are, if you can buy your freedom, do it. But don't think that's going to make or break you in the Christian life. First Corinthians 7. You, I mean, did you come from po folks? That's okay. You come from rich folks? That's okay too. That's even better. But God knows where you are. All right? Don't think that, boy, I could have just made it in life if I hadn't had this defect, if I hadn't been born over here. How about when you come to Christ? When he who had me set apart from my mother's womb and called me through his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Paul's conversion came right when God wanted it. All events. What event is outside of the sovereignty of God? A woman said to G. Campbell Morgan, is God concerned about my little things? Morgan said to her, what makes you think your big things are so big? All events. Rejoice. How often? Always. Pray without ceasing, in what give things? Everything. In all things, give things. This is God's will for you. Paul's thought is, if it happened in time and space, God is not one to shrug, to snap his fingers, or to say, oh shucks. God is sovereign. But God, it's evil. I know. But God, it didn't please you. I know. God, it went against everything that's moral. I know. It broke my heart. You're not telling me anything. Will you get rid of it? Yes. Did you command it? No. Did it happen? Yes. Despise not the chastening of God. 
all events. He hath made everything beautiful in its time. Song of Solomon, but the music by Ray Steele. Did you know that? <laughs> you didn't even know that. You don't know your history, Mike. Ray Steele. How about the purpose and the progress of history? Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? Acts 1.6. Answer, it is not for you to know the times that are fixed by the Father's authority. There will be a day, meaning, that I will return and set up my kingdom with Israel. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses. And this same Jesus who was taken up from you shall return the same way as he left, right to the Mount of Olives. When's he going to come? In the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. He was the testimony born at the proper time. First Timothy, somewhere. And when he, recur when he returns, which he shall bring about at the proper time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus' birth, death, and return will be at the, quote, time fixed by the Father's authority. Right now, Paul said, a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And then that entire nation will turn back to him. You know, one of the problems with being a modern man, I'll tell you what it is. Modern man in his secularism and his atheism and his humanism to the disregard of a sovereign has made the universe um, occurrences with no rhyme. They are day to day with no meaning. They come from no place, they mean nothing, and they go nowhere. I love the Bible's view of history. In the beginning, God created. Adam in his image, God said. And there you see the ongoing of history and God's purposes until it ends when he comes about in his proper time, the blessed and only sovereign. History has meaning, and the actors on the stage of the Bible's view of reality have reality, purpose, meaning, dignity. They can trust God for their place in the script. That's what I love about the biblical view of history. It means something. One of the greatest things my mother did for me, I... Uh, was raised by a woman named Lavelle Perry Nelson. And she, to this day, was the greatest um, force in my life. And I've studied under some fine men, but I never had one like my mother. That sounded bad, didn't it? Never had a man like my mother. No, I didn't. <laughs> never had anybody like my mother. And you know what? She instilled to me from the time that I was a very little bitty fellow that you are here because God made you and you have a purpose. And we don't know what it is. And she would say, and it may, his purposes may flow like a river here and there, day to day. You never know when they'll end or where they'll end. But God has a reason. And if he wants to take you out, he can. But he has a reason for your being here. And from the time I was little, I always lived my life with a sense of destiny. And I think that of all the things, as I look back in retrospect on my years, that was one of the greatest godsends of my life. My mother gave me a sense of destiny. And she did that because she was Christian. I've tried to build it into my boys. You have a purpose. There's a reason for you. Uh, I'm not sure what it is. I can tell you, and all we have to operate on are God's precepts. I don't have to know the end of the play. I do have to know the rules. And I seek to follow them, seek to obey them, but I can act even in my own sin, even in harsh occurrences. I can act with this fetal sack around me, this blessed, metaphysical, amniotic, life-sustaining thing that is called 
the sovereignty of God. Though the mountains should slip into the sea, that there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. God is in the midst of her. He's right here. And he shall not be moved. Now, let me tell you a couple of things here and we quit. In all of this, it doesn't mean that God is not passable. Y'all know what that term means? Passion, meaning pain or emotion. God is represented in the Bible as sovereign, yet passable. We like to take one or the other. If he is sovereign, he is unfeeling. If he is feeling, he's a good old boy, but he's not in charge. Because we tend to operate in a world where we feel things or we ordain things. And when things get in the way of what we ordain, they conflict with us, they stop our plans, and we switch to being bugged. We're not aware of being able to sovereignly direct something and at the time, to, same time feel in time and space emotion. We can't do that. God can. He can ordain the salvation of the elect and yet when it happens, what do the angels do? They rejoice. It had to happen. Why do they rejoice? Uh, God does not delight in the death of the wicked. But doesn't he ordain it? Yes. Does he still have a passability and grieve at it? Yes. Does he desire in his emotion, Thalo, for all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? Yes. Does he ordain otherwise? Yes. I can't do that. I know. That's why you're a human. He is a God. He is sovereign. And he can do it. So God is passable. Uh, secondly, man is responsible. Judas betrayed Christ that the scripture could be fulfilled. If he had to do it, then he's not culpable, right? Jesus said it had been better for you if you had not been born. Which do you want? Sovereignty or culpability? Both are true. That's not fair. No, that's God. Spurgeon was asked, how do you reconcile man's will and the sovereignty of God? He said, you don't reconcile friends. They're not in antagonism. Man's will operates perfectly within the sovereignty of God. And God's emotion to what he does is true, valid, passionate emotion. Happy or sad. That's the biblical testimony. You say, Tommy, that don't make sense. Aren't you glad we don't build theology on your sense? I'm going to give you a great statement. Are you ready? It's the sum total of all my years of wisdom. <laughs> Listen to this. Don't build the rafters and the, the rebar upon which your life stands Build it upon those things the book declares true of the deity. They'll, it'll be the best of all worlds every time if you'll do that. Don't build your theology on the black hole of your reason. It says God is sovereign, but it says that God grieves or is happy over what he knows. That doesn't seem right to my giant brain that's been active for about 40 years. And in light of the eternal, my brain can't fathom it. So I'll reject the truth and I will stand on the anti-matter of my own ignorance. Now that's where a lot of Christians are. What do you believe? Answer, all those things I can't understand in the sense that it doesn't jive with my reason, so I reject the truth and I stand on it. It won't hold up. Don't build your theology on the formulation of your own ignorance. Read the book. It's the best of all worlds. A God who is sovereign and passable. Man who is responsible and yet can rest in all things. It's the best of all worlds. I had a guy say that to me once. You know, talking with an atheist. He said, no, wait a minute. You hold God as sovereign. Yes, but he's still passable. Yes. You can do bad things, him be angry, you be judged, and it's still for the ultimate good. Yes. He said, all that is is the best of all possible worlds. And I said, you're right. 
That's the way, if you're a god, you can create things. When I finish here, don't assault me. I know right now, I can see you, you're writing down these questions, 36, 37, <laughs> and you're going to do a dead sprint up here and go, Tommy, can you just answer me one thing? If, then, what? <laughs> why should we witness if he's ordained already? Answer, because he told you to. Do it. Why should we obey if all things are ordained? He told you to. All right? Tom, do you understand how he can ordain men to be saved and those to glorify his justice and still be just? No. I can't tell you how. Can you tell me why I'm to do something when it's ordained already? I, I can't figure it out. And so all I'm going to do is look at you and go, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway. And incidentally, that's where C.S. Lewis would have left you. That's where Spurgeon would have left you. That's where Knox would have left you and Calvin would have left you. So I don't have any answers for you. But I do know this. This system is a rose. It's the best. And anything else falls apart in time and space. Trust him. William Cowper. Or was it Isaac Watts? Listen to this. Can't say it any better. Watts. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. Under the shadow of thy throne, Thy saints have dwelt secure. Sufficient is thine arm alone, and our defense is sure. Don't you like that? Under the shadow of thy throne. What language? Before the hills in order stood, our earth received its frame. From everlasting thou art God, to endless years the same. A thousand ages in thy sight are like an evening gone, short as the watch that ends the night before the rising sun. Time like an ever-rolling stream bears all its suns away. They fly, forgotten as a dream, dies at the opening day. O oh God, our help in ages past our hope for years to come. Be thou our guide while life shall last and our eternal home. This teaching makes you trust. This teaching makes you labor because he has ordained the end and the victory of its laborers. And this teaching makes you worship and adore that deity. And friend, if there is one molecule in this universe outside of the sovereignty of God, I personally do not wish to coexist in that universe at the challenge of that atom. I will pull the covers to my neck and I will tremble. If one molecule is outside of God's sovereignty and that deity that will not take and assume authority, I personally will not worship him. Yahweh alone will I worship. Will I trust? Will I obey? Will I grieve over it my transgression? And to that deity alone will I bow. Any other deity simply is not a God. Well, would you pray with me? the depth of the riches both of the knowledge and wisdom of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his footprints past finding out. 
Thou hast made, O Lord, all things for thyself. You work all things after the counsel of your will. Bless you. In the sublimeness of your anger, bless you. In the glory of your approval and your favor, we bless you. And in that final day, when all things shall thy servants be, we thank you. And I pray that if there is a one dying soul in our midst who actually has lifted his face against that one who is earth's son, who has lifted his face against the word of God which alone tells us who you are and what is true. One who has stood in defiance behind the fortress of their own religion and self-righteousness and has refused that person who bore our sins, that person who alone is righteous and in whose blood alone one might stand. Might you bring them, God, to their knees in the blinding light of the very presence of the Son of God. And might they, as sorrow of old, cry out, Who art thou, Lord? And what must I do to be saved? Let them this very day believe in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And we shall ask it in his name. Amen.